Good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning for Winship Grand Rounds. If you are an Emory University or Emory Healthcare employee and would like to receive a CME credit hour for attending today, the login information can be found in the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. If you have any uh, issues with this webinar or the CM CME login, please send Kariatu Fafana an email or drop a note via the chat feature. This morning, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Karen Jacobson. Dr. Jacobson received her medical degree from Columbia University, Vigelis College of Physicians and Sur Surgeons. She completed a two-year training program in the clinical and translational investigation, earning a master's in medical science from Harvard Medical School. She's an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and a senior physician at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Dr. Jacobson currently serves as the medical director of the Immune Effector Cell Therapy Program at Dana-Farber, which houses both the commercial and research cell therapy programs across the Institute, spanning both hematologic malignancies and solid tumors. Uh, Dr. Jacobson was awarded the NCI Cancer uh, Clinical Investigator Team Leadership Award to develop and grow a clinical and research enterprise in immune effector cell therapies for the treatment of cancer at Dana-Farber. In addition to CAR T cell therapy studies, she has been the principal investigator of several investigator-initiated studies involving immunotherapy for lymphomas, including immunotherapy combinations in the use of yeast-derived beta-glucan as an immune adjuvant to antibody therapy with rituximab. Her leadership in cellular therapies uh, as well as her ability to move back and forth between the clinic and basic science, immunology, and pathology uh, has uh, allowed her to address unmet needs in CAR T cell uh, and other cellular therapy uh, based on the identification of key mediators and mechanisms of toxicity and resistance. Her clinical focus uh, outside of uh, immune effector cell therapies is lymphoma, uh, and her research interests are in immunotherapy for the treatment of B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, thanks again, Dr. Jacobson, for joining us. We are looking forward to your uh, discussion today, and I'll turn turn this over to you. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Jonathan, and thanks, everyone, for having me. I'm just going to share my slides. Um, uh, it would be, Jonathan and I were just saying that it would be nice if uh, we could be in person, um, but uh, this is definitely convenient to be able to log on from home. So hopefully sometime in the future, I can be there in person. But I'm going to talk to you today about um, uh, what we've learned uh, for following FDA approval of CD19 CAR T cells for large B cell lymphoma uh, from our uh, clinical uh, database and biobank uh, in, uh, in order to identify clinical and translational biomarkers of efficacy and toxicity. Uh, these are my disclosures. So I think right now, uh, you know, I think we, we all understand that in terms of CAR T cell efficacy, we have to really think of uh, three major uh, players. We have to think about the T cells themselves and the quality of T cells that the either the patient or the uh, um, a healthy donor uh, produces. Uh, we have to think about uh, the patient and sort of the, their um, immune context uh, and uh, immune niches, and then the tumor itself in terms of um, how it interacts with the tumor microenvironment and then also uh, and immune cells within the tumor, tumor microenvironment, but also genetic features and factors of the tumor that may allow it to evade an immune response. So I'm going to talk about really just three, um, three studies that we've done uh, with our group at Dana-Farber that address each of these three factors. So in terms of the patient will review um, uh, you know, a retrospective post-commercial multicenter study looking at uh, CD19 CAR T cells, namely with axicaptogen sillelucil or axicel in large B cell lymphoma. Actually, Emory participated in this study uh, that really identified some clinical biomarkers of response and resistance. Um, we'll then take a look at um, some work that Scott Rodig did um, at Dana-Farber, looking at uh, dynamic tumor microenvironment biomarkers in pre and post CD19 CAR T cell tumor biopsies that gives insights into the mechanism of action of CARs in large B cell lymphoma. And then finally, um, our group in, in uh, collaboration with our colleagues at Mass General uh, and also our colleagues at the Broad actually just published in Nature Medicine uh, an analysis of the T cells uh, um, and their, their sort of evolution over time from pretreatment uh, all the way to day seven after treatment uh, and to give unique insights into how they change over time and what changes uh, associate with, with response. So we'll take a look at that data. 
Um, just to sort of level set, um, of course, we all know that CAR T cells <clears throat> for large B-cell lymphoma was really a trans uh, transformative uh, therapy for our chemotherapy refractory patients. Uh, these patients, as you can see from the orange uh, Kaplan-Meier curve here uh, for overall survival, had a median overall survival about six months before CAR T cells and uh, with uh, matched patients on, treated on the Zuma-1 study of axicaptogene cellulosal, you can see the tremendous improvement in overall survival uh, for these chemotherapy refractory patients. And I show this um, image of this patient that we treated at Dana-Farber on the right. Um, this is probably the patient, the sickest and highest tumor burden that patient that we treated. Um, uh, you know, he actually had a performance status of three coming into CAR T cell therapy um, required, as you can see here, percutaneous nephrostomy tubes uh, before he got CAR T cell therapy because of uh, his uh, intra-abdominal tumor burden and uh, ureteral obstruction. Uh, and uh, this is his one month scan, which was a very good partial response. And I'm happy to say that now two and a half years out, uh, he is a, he's in a complete response and has not had disease relapse. So just to show how powerful these therapies are. Um, and you know what, what we have seen over the course of several uh, investigations of how CAR T cells perform in the post-commercial setting where the majority of patients, you know, over 60% in some of these series uh, would not have been eligible for the clinical trials, just like that patient I just showed you on the previous slide. Slide, uh, what we're what's really um, reassuring is that we're seeing the same really excellent response rates anywhere in the range of about 60 uh, to 80 percent, and the same uh, complete response rates anywhere on the order of about 35 uh, to 60 percent. And more importantly than achieving a CR or having a response is uh, sort of the six month overall response rate, because I think that that generally predicts for long term disease free survival. And we're seeing that 35 to 50% of patients across the board are achieving that, which is similar to what was seen on the pivotal clinical trials. And, and similarly, we worry, of course, when we treat uh, patients with medical comorbidities, frailer patients, patients with poor performance statuses that uh, toxicities could be increased, but actually what we're seeing over time, if we focus on grade three cytokine release syndrome and ICANS, we're seeing an improvement over time, You know, definitely owing to the fact that we understand now that we can intervene upon these toxicities with things like tocilizumab and corticosteroids at earlier time points to prevent escalation to higher grade toxicities. So I'll take you through the first column in that last slide was uh, our multicenter series. Like I said, Emory did participate uh, and contribute patients to the series uh, of looking at AxiCell in the non-trial setting in the first year following commercial approval. So in this series, 62% of patients would have been ineligible for Zuma-1 for a variety of reasons, some of which, some of whom were only ineligible because they received bridging therapy, which was not allowed on Zuma-1, but uh, about 40% of patients were also ineligible for for other reasons, you know, performance status, um, uh, cardiac ejection fraction, uh, you know, creatinine clearance, things like that. Um, and so what you can see here is that most of the patients did have a performance status of zero to one, so 91% did, but there were 9% who had a performance status of two or greater. The majority of patients were treated for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Um, about 24% of patients had double or triple hit lymphoma, similar to what was seen on Zuma-1. Uh, patients, uh, about 46% of patients had a high IPI at the time of treatment, uh, IPI three to five. About 25% of patients had had a prior autologous stem cell transplant and uh, four patients, so which accounted for 3% of patients had had a prior allogeneic stem cell transplant. Uh, over half of patients were considered to have bulky disease at the time of treatment. Um, which was defined as a tumor, uh, the greatest tumor um, being more than five centimeters in diameter. Um, and 45% of patients did require bridging therapy. Um, and at the time of this publication, the median follow-up was 10.4 months. Um, uh, only uh, you know, 13 patients um, did have cells collected, but were not infused for a variety of reasons. Uh, large, largely owing to patient factors. Um, uh, two patients received their product on an out-of-spec protocol, and only one patient had a failure to manufacture their CAR T cells. 
Um, so when we look at the results and we compare them to the, the key results on Zuma 1, we can see that the overall response rate was 70% compared to 82% on Zuma 1. Uh, by intention to treat, when looking at the full 135 patients who had their, their T cells collected, the overall response rate was 65% compared to 75% on Zuma 1, and the CR rate was 50% um, compared to 54% on Zuma 1, with a six-month overall response rate of 40%. Um, we saw a grade three CRS in 11% of patients, and we saw a grade three neurologic toxicity in 35% of patients, which compares pretty, pretty con which was pretty consistent with, with what was seen on Zuma 1. Many more patients received tocilizumab and steroids on our, um, on our series of patients compared to Zuma 1. Um, we also saw that uh, of patients who had an initial partial response at one month, uh, about a third of them went on to deepen their response to a complete response at, um, at a later time point. Uh, Non-relapse mortality was about 6%, so there were eight deaths um, in our series. Uh, five of them were um, uh, due to uh, toxicities related to CRS or neurologic toxicity or infection, and two patients uh, died of a cardiomyopathy that was uh, felt to be unrelated. 28% uh, of patients required ICU transfer, and 18% of patients required readmission after initial hospital discharge. Um, when we looked at uh, sort of biomarkers um, of response, we really saw <clears throat> we did we we were really limited to doing univariate analysis, but we saw no correlation between IPI lymphoma characteristics <clears throat> like double or triple hit lymphomas, uh, prior lines of therapy, the use of bridging therapy, eligibility for Zuma one or not, uh, high grade CRS or ICANs or TOSI or steroid use and response. Uh, but we did see inferior outcomes with patients who had a poor performance status with a performance status of two to four, or patients who had increased tumor bulk. Um, when we looked at uh, biomarkers in the blood, um, we saw that patients who had a high uh, CRP um, on day zero were less likely to have a, a, a response to AxiCell, uh, whereas patients who had lower CRPs on day zero uh, were more likely to have either a, a complete response or a partial response. And we also saw it looked at a, uh, acute um, uh, absolute lymphocyte count at the time of leukapheresis as sort of a potential marker for the health of the lymphocytes at that time. And patients who had a higher lymphocyte count at leukapheresis were more likely to have a complete response or partial response uh, compared to those who had a lower um, lymphocyte count at the time of leukapheresis. Uh, when we looked at uh, sort of similar variables in terms of risk of uh, cytokine release syndrome or ICANs, we saw no correlation between these toxicities and performance status, tumor bulk, IPI, prior lines of therapy, bridging therapy, or Zuma-1 eligibility. Uh, but we did see that patients who had a high peak CRP were more likely to have um, high-grade neurologic toxicity, uh, and patients who had uh, a high uh, peak ferritin were more likely to have high-grade CRS as well as high-grade neurologic toxicity. Not totally surprising. Um, uh, day zero CRP did seem to predict uh, for patients who had, were likely to, more likely to have higher-grade neurologic toxicity as well. So um, we, when we, these are the Kaplan-Meier curves for durability, duration of response on the left, um, progression-free survival in the middle, and overall survival on the right. Um, and uh, the black line re uh, reflects all patients, and the green line reflects patients who had a best response as a partial response, and the blue line reflects patients who had a best response of a complete response. Uh, and these curves really overlie um, actually perfectly with the Kaplan-Meier curves for D. OR, PFS, and OS for the Zuma-1 study. So this really did correlate with what we saw on Zuma-1. Um, and then when we looked at whether um, patients who would have been eligible for Zuma-1 compared to those uh, in black, compared to those who would have been ineligible for Zuma-1 for any reason in, in red, we see that there, while the response rate is the same in the Zuma-1 ineligible patients, durability of response, uh, progression-free survival, and overall survival are actually significantly reduced in this group of patients. Now, I, when I present this data, I don't suggest that these are patients who should not receive CAR T cells, because I still think that they do better uh, and have and have a potential to have a definitive response uh, with a higher 
at a higher frequency than almost any other therapy we could offer these patients, but I, I do identify them as a, <clears throat> an unmet need, a group of patients who need better, better cell therapy strategies to improve their durability of response. Uh, we took a look at um, when we saw that pretreatment inflammation seemed to correlate with, uh, with both response and toxicity, we took a look at how these pretreatment and in, uh, inflammatory markers correlated with outcomes over time, not just a static output of response rate. Um, and so we identified a, a cutoff of a CRP of 30 as uh, the difference between a high CRP and a low CRP at baseline, and a serum ferritin of 5,000 as a difference between a high uh, serum ferritin at baseline and a low serum ferritin at baseline. And you can see that patients who had high uh, CRP and ferritins as depicted by the red curves here had a, um, a significantly decreased uh, duration of response for uh, CRP and then uh, progression-free survival and overall survival for both CRP and ferritin. So tell, telling us that pretreatment inflammation correlates negatively with outcomes over time. We um, also collected, uh, we've been collecting blood serially from our patients before treatment at the time of uh, leukapheresis, at the time of lymphodepletion, and then at serial time points after CAR T cell um, infusion. Um, and we have analyzed them by um, by Cytoff for a number, you know, for a number of different immunomodulatory markers uh, on the T cells, um, as well as uh, flow cytometry, um, and we did have uh, stains for uh, Axi cell to use in this assay. And what we saw is that response uh, did associate with markers of activation on both CAR positive and CAR negative T cells. So if you um, look in the the middle panel, you can see that uh, patients who had um, uh, CD4 CAR T cells. These were all done at day seven, which was because that ended up that ended up being the peak expansion of CAR T cells for our patients. Um, uh, patients who had uh, higher patients who responded had a higher proportion of KI67 positive CD uh, CAR positive CD4 cells uh, compared to those who didn't respond. And then interestingly, ICOs came out as a marker of activation that was associated uh, with response in CAR negative CD4 uh, cells of responders versus those who were not responders. And what you can see on the right is that when we when we um, when we follow uh, key 67 PD1 41BB lag3 TIM3 and cleave caspase 3 over time, they go up not only in the CAR T cells over the first two weeks um, uh, following infusion, but they actually do peak in the non-CAR T cells as well, suggesting that non-CAR T cells are recruited um, and activated uh, following activation of CAR uh, T cells. And we also uh, incorporated, uh, uh, when we could, uh, serial biopsies for patients, especially patients with primary resistance to uh, AxiCell. And so we, uh, these were uh, two biopsies of patients uh, who were primary refractory. The first patient uh, had a biopsy on day 37 after treatment, and that's the patient on the left. And the second patient had a biopsy on day 58 after treatment, and that's the biopsy on the right. So it, um, what, what, just to, um, what you can see here is the KIP1 is the stain for, for axi cell, the CAR positive T cells, and so they will light up in green. Um, obviously, PAX5 is in purple here, which represents tumor cells, um, and then the other T cells that are not CAR T cells will show up in white. Um, and what you can see here is that this patient has residual tumor. Um, they have, uh, uh, they do have CAR T cells within the tumor as well as other T cells. Um, and then when we stained for CD19 and PDL1, this, this patient probably had two mechanisms of resistance. They had no uh, CD19 positivity on their tumor cells, and their tumor cells uh, uh, overexpress PDL1 100% of the time. Um, and so this patient uh, probably had multiple mechanisms of resistance. Uh, the second patient is a patient who had a mixed response uh, with progression of um, cutaneous sites of disease. And so this was actually a biopsy, but had a complete response in nodal sites of disease. And this was a biopsy of her cutaneous uh, tumor on day 58 following treatment. 
Um, what you can see here, and I didn't show you here, but um, I just wanted to show the CD19 was retained in this tumor, uh, which were also PAX5 positive. There were uh, T cells in the tumor microenvironment, but when we stained for KIP1, there were no CAR T cells in the tumor microenvironment, and this tumor did not overexpress PDL1. Um, and so this suggested that this, you know, it's hard to know because this is day 58 after treatment, but it, but it, uh, it could, this could represent a failure of CAR T cells to traffic to the skin site of disease, uh, as opposed to the first patient where CAR T cells did get there, uh, but there were two intrinsic mechanisms of resistance within the tumor cells. Um, so that work was done by Scott Rodig, who then also did, in collaboration with Kite, uh, did um, a study where he looked at pre and on treatment biopsies uh, uh, following axicel infusion. So these were biopsies that were done uh, in patients who consented uh, to them uh, sometime between day five and day 15 after their CAR T cell infusion. Um, and of course, patients were then followed over time to see if they responded or did not respond to their CAR T cells. Um, and what you can see is uh, when you look at PAX5, you can actually see clearance of uh, PAX5 positive cells very early on after CAR T cell infusion. When you look at CD3 uh, T cells, you can see that they're present uh, both before treatment and after treatment. Uh, but importantly, what you can see um, is that the patients who responded, which are represented in red on this bar graph, had a higher proportion of CD3 uh, T cells um, following treatment, uh, so a, a bigger delta of CD3 T cells following treatment compared to those who didn't respond. So there were T cells that were recruited uh, to the tumor microenvironment uh, after treatment in patients who were responders. And then when you look at those T cells uh, in the tumor microenvironment, you can and, and you and you stain them for um, a variety of activation markers. You can see that uh, in responders, the proportion of CD8 positive uh, T cells that were also PD1 positive were higher um, than patients who were non-responders, whereas the proportion of CD4 positive uh, PD1 uh, T cells were similar in responders or non-responders. So teaching us a couple of things that um, you know that non that T cells are increased in the tumor microenvironment following CAR T cell infusion, and that associates with response, uh, and so does uh, and so does uh, CD8 T cell activation as uh, um, marked by increased PD-1 expression. Um, so the next thing that they looked at is um, you know, sort of how many of these T cells in the tumor microenvironment that were increased in responders were actually CAR positive T cells. And they used the KIP1 in green and the KIP3 stains in red to take a look at the proportion of uh, CAR T cells. And it looks like, as you can see here, CAR T cells really do make up the minority of T cells in the tumor microenvironment during this time frame. Um, and just to make sure that this wasn't just down regulation of the car on the surface of the T cell, uh, they actually did do um, RNA uh, expression analysis and saw that only you know a rare T cell in the tumor microenvironment was actually um, had car, the RNA for the car um, present. So the, the, there were the majority of T cells in the tumor microenvironment are indeed non-CAR T cells. However, the CAR T cells that are in the tumor microenvironment um, are the majority are activated. So you can see that they express uh, key 67, they express granzyme, they express PD-1, and they also uh, are um, have uh, um, transcripts for interferon gamma. So they're producing interferon gamma. And I think this is probably one of the more interesting aspects of the study, um, but the it turns out that um, uh, non-CAR T cells, so, so yes, the, the CAR T cells are activated and they are um, producing interferon gamma, uh, but actually, actually non-CAR T cells that upregulate interferon gamma and IL-6 in the present of CAR T cells with most of the IL-6 coming from the non-CAR T cells. Um, so if you, uh, so you can see here that um, you, definitely there's, there's uh, more of the T cells that uh, are key 67 positive or CAR T cells compared to non-CAR T cells in the tumor microenvironment. Um, similarly with overexpression of PD-1, similarly with expression of granzyme, um, and uh, similarly with, with uh, synthesis of interferon gamma. But when we look at uh, 
you look at IL-6 uh, production, um, it, uh, the majority of the IL-6 is actually coming from the non-CAR T cells, and that's depicted here by uh, looking at our RNA transcripts for IL-6, both in the CAR positive and CAR negative uh, T cells. And so it led to this hypothesis that, you know, and it, it's yet to be proven, but it, it's something uh, that's intriguing and that we could, we can definitely continue to work on is the CAR T cell is really the Trojan horse. So the CAR T cell makes its way to the tumor microenvironment, the, the tumor in the tumor microenvironment. It interacts with CD19 on the surface of the T cells, which leads to interferon gamma production and granzyme and PD1 expression and key 67 uh, expression. And then um, that leads to recruitment of both uh, non-CAR T cells as well as uh, non-CAR other immune effector cells like macrophages and monocytes, uh, which lead to IL-6 production, which probably further recruits other immune effector cells uh, to sort of finish off the tumor cell killing. And so this is a hypothesis that we continue to work on um, uh, with our collaborators at Dana-Farber. And so the last study I wanted to talk about today um, was the study that, like I said, was a collaboration between our colleagues at Mass General, Marcella Maus and Matt Fergalt, and our colleagues um, at uh, the Broad, uh, specifically uh, Gaddy Getz, uh, you know, to think about the T cells and to use single cell sequencing to track T cells over time after CAR T cell infusion. And so this study used, um, uh, the study included patients, 19 patients who were treated with AxiCell in the commercial setting and 13 patients that were treated with Tisicel in the commercial setting. And uh, we looked at uh, baseline peripheral blood mononuclear cells that were taken anytime within 30 days before uh, CAR T cell infusion or the start of lymphoid depletion. Um, we also, also looked at the infusion product for these um, uh, for these patients who got their CAR, uh, you know, patients, these are these patients were included because we had access to their infusion product, and then we looked at their day seven, um, both CAR positive and CAR negative uh, T cells. Um, uh, also CAR negative non T cells. Uh, and then the idea was to, uh, you know, for each of these time points to do single cell RNA seq uh, to both uh, catalog um, sort of the expression profile or, or uh, T cell phenotype that associated with response and non response, and then to track these clones over time to understand uh, sort of what the, fa what the factors were that contributed to response. Um, so um, what we, the first thing that we saw was that gene expression following infusion highlighted differences between the two products, as well as similarities reflecting induction of CAR T cell activation induced cell death pathways. So, um, you know, we, uh, so again, we looked at, um, you know, we could compare populations of T cells uh, that were CAR positive and CAR negative, that were CD8 positive and CD8 negative, and compare them between each other. Um, and what, what we saw was that for, um, for AXI cell, more than for uh, TISA cell, there were um, uh, upregulation of, of activation markers, uh, which was felt to reflect what we know about CD28 CARs compared to 41BB CARs, that they are activated more quickly and expand more quickly in vivo um, than patients who receive four, then 41BB cars uh, following infusion. Um, and so this sort of reflected the biology of AXI cell. Whereas if you looked at um, sort of a 41BB uh, gene expression signature um, for patients who receive TISA cell here on the left or AXI cell here on the right, you can see that um, uh, CAR T cells that express this 41BB gene signature were enhanced in responders compared to non responders, whereas there was no difference uh, for this gene signature in responders or non-responders for axi cells. So at least this sort of corroborated that this made sense. This, uh, uh, you know, this did uh, um, sort of jive with the biology uh, and the differences between the two CAR T cells and uh, gave us uh, confidence uh, in our ability to, to look at other factors. So the next thing uh, that, that was noticed was that um, CD, uh, CD8 T cell expansion associated with response in TISA, following TISA cell, but not following AXI cell. So if you take a look at the Kaplan-Meier curves on the top left, uh, what you can see is that um, 
uh, patients, the, the blue line represents patients who had a high proportion of CD8 positive T cells at the day seven time point, whereas the red bars represent patients who had low numbers of CD8 T cells at the day seven time point. Um, and this is uh, looking at response um, over time, you know, response over time. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, for, for patients who received Tizacel, those who had a higher number of CD8 positive T cells at day seven, and this is all T cells, not just CAR positive T cells, uh, did better than patients who didn't, whereas for AxiCell, there, there was no, no difference. Um, and if, and, and that's corroborated here um, on, on these plots that show that both patients, uh, so in blue is, uh, ac in, in blue is Tisacel and in orange is AxiCell, um, responders are triangles and non-responders are X's. And you can see that, um, uh, so not only were CD8 uh, CAR T cells um, expand or, or in greater proportion at day seven, but they actually expanded from the um, investigation, uh, the infusion product. So when we look, when we plot CD8, uh, CAR, uh, CD8 positive CAR T cells, at day seven versus the fraction of CD8 positive uh, T cells in the infusion product, you can see that it basically matches um, the infusion product um, and the uh, day seven CD8 positive CAR T cell proportions uh, track each other for axi cell and orange, but in TISA cell, with TISA cell, you can see that there is a expansion of these CD8 positive um, CAR T cells on day seven in responders that did not happen in non-responders. And so it turns out that, um, uh, you know, that, that uh, there's some, there is something specific about uh, CD8 expansion um, of uh, TISA cell uh, CD8 expansion that does predict for response. So when you look at axi cell patients who got axi cell over time and you compare their infusion product to their uh, day seven carb uh, T cells uh, in the blood, uh, you can see that the proportion of um, both CD4 on the left and CD8 uh, CAR T cells sort of mirrors the proportion that was present in, in the investigational product. Whereas if you look at CD4 T cells uh, for TISA cell, um, they actually uh, do not expand in vivo and actually go down to almost zero. Uh, whereas uh, patients who had a response uh, had a higher proportion of CD8 T cells at that day seven time point. And this, is th this may be due to a differential uh, gene expression profile of these CD8 T cells in the the investigational product. So when we look at um, when we map out um, gene expression and we compare amongst responders and non-responders for TISA cell, we can see a number of genes that are upregulated in responders uh, in, in the infusional product and downregulated and, and uh, versus upregulated in non-responders. Um, and so it, it suggests that there that these T cells in the infusional product have a specific gene expression profile that allows for expansion upon infusion into the patient um, or differential expansion upon reinfusion into the patient. And this is associated with response. Um, and so then, uh, you know, I think that we can take this a little bit further um, and sort of track, um, you know, the, the base, you know, we can try, we, you know, just at, not in a terribly dissimilar way that I just explained, we were able to track um, a number of uh, cell types over time. Um, we uh, tended to sort these based on the expression of uh, CCR7, uh, CD5RA, and CD5RO uh, to sort of categorize uh, cells as either central memory, effector memory, um, or terminal effector memory uh, T cells. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the, the point here is just there is the greatest difference. So this is a complicated sort of graphic here, but on the the, the top are represent patient, uh, what happened to TISA cell infusion products over time, and the bottom represents what happened to axi cell. I think the point here is that you can see that these circles uh, between infusion product and day seven changed more significantly um, for, for the TISA cell product than they did 
for AxiCell. And then if you look at sort of responders versus non-responders over time, you can see different patterns of how these T cells changed over time that associated with response. Um, and so there was, uh, you know, there is definitely um, sort of more dynamic changes in T cell populations over time with Tisacell that do tend to lend to um, response, whereas for AxiCell, the T cell populations seem to track with each other over time, and that's not necessarily the uh, determinant of response. Um, and uh, that's sort of better depicted down here um, uh, in the bottom right, where if you look at the uh, fraction of cells out of all CD8 positive CAR T cells that are considered or characterized as central memory, effector memory one and effector memory two um, within the TISA cell, um, investigational product, you can see that responders had a much higher proportion of central memory um, T cells in their infusion product uh, compared to non-responders, whereas non-responders had a higher proportion of effector memory, you know, really corroborating what we uh, suggested um, in the previous slide, which is that there is a, a T cell phenotype and a gene expression profile within the CD8 positive T cells in the investigational product for TISA cell that uh, really helped to, you know, very strongly correlated with response or non response. Um, and the real only um, association uh, for, or in the investigate in the infusion product for AxiCell that correlated uh, with lack of response was a higher proportion of Fox3 positive CAR T reg cells that were present in the infusional product um, before infusion that led to lack of response and and you know to prove that this was true. Um, uh, we conducted both in vitro and in vivo experiments. And um, so here you can just on the top on the top uh, left, you can see that patients who respond who responded had uh, significantly lower amounts of uh, CAR positive Tregs in the infusional product compared to patients who didn't respond. There was a, a trend for TISA cell, but it was not statistically significant. Um, and then, so to test uh, to test this in in vitro, um, we took uh, mice that um, uh, that uh, were growing JCO positive large B cell lymphoma tumors, and they were treated at day zero with um, uh, you know, different uh, sort of different uh, combinations of CAR positive T cells. So, uh, in uh, so the first experiment we did was actually using 25% uh, of the T cells being uh, CAR T reg cells, uh, and the control was using 25% of CAR uh, CD4 positive CAR cells that were not T regs. And then a subsequent experiment actually brought this fraction down to 5% of the CAR T cell product. And then we followed patient, uh, patients, we followed the mice over time. And you can see that even with just 5% of CAR positive T regs um, in the infusion product, um, these mice developed recurrent tumors, whereas uh, the mice who did not have this population of Tregs did not develop recurrent tumors. And then lastly, we had one patient who actually had had successful retreatment with Tisacel uh, that we had uh, infusion product for both infusions as well as serial blood samples for this patient over time. And, and what was interesting is this successful retreatment was actually re uh, associated with a um, sort of a differential expansion of CAR positive T cells uh, between the first and second infusion. So despite the fact that the investigational product had similar populations of T cells um, for both infusions, the actual T cells uh, evolved over time in the first week after CAR T cell infusion differently in, after each infusion. Um, and the, the second infusion was associated with a greater proportion um, of effector memory um, uh, T cells and led to a more durable response. And so this suggested that you could, you could, you know, of course, we're talking about how you can manipulate the T cells themselves um, to make better products. Um, and then there's also a question of how you can manipulate the tumor and the effects of the tumor on the peripheral immune state uh, to lead to more effective CAR T cells over time. And I think while we don't totally understand the differences between what the T cells saw after infusion between the first and second infusion here, it does, it does suggest that um, by studying patients like this, we may understand 
you know, ways we can manipulate either the tumor or the tumor microenvironment or the, you know, or the patient's tumor uh, milieu or uh, sort of immune milieu um, post-treatment to sort of select for expansion of more effective uh, T cells. So, you know, when we put this in the context of what, what else has been um, shown from other sites and other centers in terms of predictors of response and toxicity, um, you know, we, as I said, we're, we're looking at patient factors, uh, T cell factors, and tumor factors. On the side of improve, improved response, over and over again, we've seen that low tumor burden and low uh, pretreatment LDH, as well as low pretreatment inflammatory markers are associated with improved response. I shared some data that we and others have shown that absence of medical comorbidities and a lack of a need for bridging therapy are also associated with improved response. And then looking at the T cells, um, uh, you know, multiple groups have shown that the proportion of C CCR7 positive and other early memory T cells in the CAR product are important. Our, our, our small series didn't necessarily corroborate that. Um, uh, um, others others uh, have shown that, that T cells that double faster in vitro during manufacturing also are more productive. And uh, for patients who have a high tumor burden, uh, patients who can achieve a higher CAR T cell peak um, uh, to match the tumor burden, um, so it's the so-called CAR T cell peak to tumor burden ratio, uh, are more likely to have durable responses. And then what we've learned about the tumor itself is <clears throat> We learned that um, uh, the group at Stanford has shown us that the absence of CD58 mutations uh, leads to better responses. CD58, of course, is a ligand for CD2, and so it's thought to be needed for extra T cell help um, and activation. And so the loss of it or the muta or mutations in CD58 that don't uh, signal through CD2 for the T cell can lead to lack of response. Um, we've seen that uh, low tumor myeloid derived suppressor cells are associated with better response, presumably because they uh, don't inhibit uh, T cells within the tumor microenvironment uh, from launching an immune attack. And we and others have shown that uh, higher proportions of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, either pre treatment or uh, early post treatment, are associated with better response. Um, and uh, the group at Novartis has shown that absence of MYC overexpression doesn't predict for lack of response, but predicts for. Uh, or doesn't predict for a differential response, but does predict for a differential duration of response. Um, and so I wanted to just take a look at um, some data that came from um, the Zuma One clinical trial of AxiCell that maybe sort of, you know, gives us a little bit of insight into how we can think about how CAR T cells work and how we can optimize patients and their T cells in the future. So as we, as we've as I mentioned, tumor burden does negatively impact dur durability of response, um, but this can be overcome by CAR T cell expansion. Um, uh, ba based on patients treated on Zuma 1, high levels of pretreatment inflammation and high, high circulating myeloid derived suppressor cells negatively correlate with CAR T cell expansion, but also positively correlate with high tumor burden. So there, we're starting to understand what the impact of tumor burden is on um, CAR T cell function. And, and what was also interesting is that they were able to show that product attributes, including high CD8 positive T cells and a high proportion of naive T cells can overcome the negative influence of high tumor burden under durability response because these CAR T cells do tend to expand sufficiently uh, in vivo after infusion, but these product attributes uh, correlated with high levels of uh, a certain uh, uh, type of naive T cell uh, in the blood collected at phoresis and low numbers of intermediate monocytes uh, in the phoresis product, as well as a hot tumor microenvironment. And so it tells you really this kind of hypothetic, hypothetical triad of tumor systemic immune state and axicell attributes that influence durability of response. So, um, you know, there's the tumor immune contexture, which actually can, uh, has an influence on the pre-existing immune state and the type of T cells that are collected for phoresis, which then directly uh, impacts the type of T cells uh, that are produced during manufacturing. And then upon reinfusion, uh, there is a interaction between the tumor immune contexture and the product that can determine whether or not uh, the product will be successful. And so how can we use this uh, information to improve durable 
over emissions to AxiCell um, based on this model. I think we can start thinking about effectively bridging uh, patients with therapies that can decrease tumor burden and alter the tumor microenvironment uh, immune signature, ideally before T cell collection. Uh, we can think about modifying lymphodepletion or preconditioning with the addition of agents that could modify the immune signature of the tumor microenvironment and the systemic immune profile. Um, we can think about ways to alter T-cell phenotype ex vivo during manufacturing if it, it, if it can't be done in vivo prior to phoresis. And then I think more and more we're realizing if we treat patients earlier in their disease course when they may have less tumor and have seen fewer lines of therapy, uh, this could positively impact uh, efficacy of these CAR T cell products. Um, so this is my last slide. Um, you want to obviously go back to thinking about the T cells, the patient, and the tumor, and what we may have, what I think we have learned from uh, both others and our investigation. Um, so in terms of in terms of how to optimize CAR T cell efficacy, and so we think about the patient. Um, you know, I think we want to select or treat patients prior to CAR. Um, so they're less inflamed and have less tumor burden. So I think it's optimizing the patient um, with those goals in mind. And I, I'm not saying that I know exactly how to do that, but um, I think some of the studies, I think the Zuma 12 study that looked at patients who had had two cycles of our CHOP or our EPOC before they saw their CAR T cell uh, and had most of them who, who probably had tumors in response just weren't in a complete response seemed to do significantly better than patients uh, who get their CAR T cells in disease relapse. And so I think thinking about treating patients in disease response uh, could potentially achieve this. When we think about the tumor, um, I think we uh, need to consider pre-treating patients either with bridging or lymphodepletion regimens that can alter the tumor immune contexture to be more immune stimulatory. Um, and then finally, when we think about the T cells, I think we need to think about strategies to both optimize the patients and the tumor that could improve the T cells that we can collect. And if we can't figure that out, uh, we can do it or select for it ex vivo during manufacturing. Um, so that is my last slide. I think we have ample time for questions. So I'm going to stop sharing and we can take a look and see if there are any questions. Yes, great. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Jacobson, uh, for uh, an outstanding talk. I've had the pleasure of hearing you speak before and I always uh, learn a ton, so I appreciate it. Um, I, know the, I know our audience does as well. Uh, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen. I see that we have one question that's already come in. Um, while we do wait on additional questions, I wanted to mention that next week there will be no Grand Round. Uh, to view all upcoming Winship Grand Round lectures, please visit the Grand Rounds page on the Winship Cancer Center uh, website or the Winship uh, calendar. So um, you may be able to see Dr. Waller's posted a question. I'm going to actually, if it's okay, you, you surf uh, that with one uh, more of a clinical question, um, and then I'll let you get to his question. So uh, you showed early on in the talk um, the your real world data, which highlights what I think we all recognize is that patients who don't achieve a complete response, in the most for the most part, are unfortunately destined to relapse. Uh, one of the challenges I think that we've had, at least practically is figuring out when is the right time to re-image patients post CAR T and what do you do with the patient who looks well, um, who's clearly had a nice response, but still has a little bit of smoldering disease on their PET scan. Um, in my own experience, I've had a, some of those patients that have gone on to do very well. I've had others that have called back four or five weeks later with now symptoms and, and widespread disease. So I'm just curious sort of how you um, when, when should we be re-imaging patients and when should we de declare somebody to be a, a, a PR, which may unfortunately make us need to start thinking about new treatment? Yeah. So this is a great question. Um, you know, I think, I think repeatedly we've seen across the products that about 30, 25 to 30% of those partial responses will be complete responses at later imaging, which makes it hard to sort of react uh, to those patients at that early time point. So my general practice has been um, with a Dovil 3 or 4 PET scan, and I know Dovil 3, I, I do consider a complete metabolic response, but I worry about those patients after CAR a little bit more. Um, I, at, at one month, I, gen, I tend to repeat that at three months, so two months later, um, to, to see how patients are uh, progressing or not progressing. 
Um, and for patients who have a dovil one or two, I don't re-image until six months uh, just to make, make sure they're maintaining their response. Um, I think this is a really important question about how we can identify the patients who have that early sort of dovil three, four, or five PET scan, but it qualifies as a well, Dovil 4 or 5 PET scan that qualifies as a partial response or, or high risk Dovil 3 patients. Um, so that, because I think there's probably an opportunity to intervene and treat those patients at that early one month, month time point um, with some other therapy to either boost the CAR T cell response, you know, to, to, to um, recruit the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes to do something to overcome whatever is causing the lack of response in the ultimate progression. Um, and so I know that there is an alliance study looking at, um, you know, different therapies to give to patients automatically at that one month time point. Um, we are planning a study um, where we are going to take those patients, all patients with a Dovil 3, 4, or 5 PR or stable disease PET scan, um, and actually re-biopsy them and look for MRD. And based on the biopsy results and MRD results, put them into different uh, management baskets. So either observation, if we can't find evidence of tumor, uh, actually repeat car infusion, if there's still CD19 positive, a checkpoint inhibitor if they have any overexpression of PDL1 in the biopsy, and then um, you know, in, in discussion about possibly a bispecific for, for the rest of the group in that setting. Um, we also did take a look with our nuclear medicine colleagues about any sort of PET uh, features on that one month PET scan for the PR patients that could help us identify who was bound to relapse and who's uh, bound to deepen their remission. And not surprisingly, um, you know, higher uh, tumor uh, metabolic tumor volume on that one month PET, um, and uh, sort of a, a, a smaller delta of uh, SUV max between the pretreatment um, uh, PET scan and the post-treatment PET scan do correlate. So we may be able to use some clinical features at that time point to help identify some patients if we can identify what would be effective treatments for them uh, to employ at that time point. Sure, great, thanks so much. Yeah, very complicated problem. Yeah. Um, so it does look like we have a few questions in the Q&A. Are, are you able to see these okay? Yeah, I can. Yeah, so I yeah. see Dr. Waller's uh, question and it's a great question. Um, yeah, so I think, I think we do, it does look like the, I mean, I think, I think, uh, CD28 and 41BB have actually much more significant impact on, on sort of CAR T cell uh, efficacy um, or CAR T cell mechanism of action than just the difference in CAR PK after infusion. Um, and so it, it does give me pause. I agree. The question is does the Trojan horse hypothesis, given this, apply to TISA cell as well? Or, um, is efficacy for this product more CAR T cell intrinsic? And I think I think it does give me pause to look at you know a lot of the emerging data for any one of these products in terms of uh, you know um, mechanisms of response or resistance and apply it to the opposite product. So I. I, I don't know. I don't. I, I think that uh, Novartis did show um, that patients who had higher uh, proportions of T cell of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes in their pretreatment biopsy were had more durable responses after TISA cell as well. Uh, they also showed that if those T cells uh, uh, pretreatment had higher expression of lag three, they were less likely to respond. And they also showed that tumors that had higher proportions of myeloid derived suppressor cells were less likely to have durable responses. And so all of that suggests to me that the, uh, TISA cell also um, recruits uh, cells within the, the tumor microenvironment. But I, I do take your point, which is that I, I'm not sure that we can mix and match um, what we learn from CD8 cars to what we, uh, and, and suppose that we can apply that to 41BB cars and vice versa. Um, the next uh, question is any comment on the token of TCF1-7 expression in CARS as it relates to response, and I have to uh, admit uh, uh, ignorance on this, so if anyone else <laughs> wants to uh, type in a response to Dr. Waller's question, I welcome it. Um, and the second question uh, is with many patients ineligible for CAR T cell, 62% ineligible for ZUMA1, what is your process for this patient population? Um, and so um, I think 
as I'm sure has happened at Emory over time is, you know, we started with pretty strict eligibility criteria uh, for who we would treat in the commercial setting. And it's been greatly relaxed over time as uh, both as we learn that if we give TOSI and steroids earlier to patients, uh, we can, we can prevent high grade toxicities. Uh, you know, I think with the uh, you know, the approval of the 4MBB cars that have less toxicity and, and with the um, Zuma 1 cohort 6 data that looks at giving patients uh, steroids on day 0, 1, and 2 of their CAR T-cell infusion, that's sort of definitely made us more comfortable treating patients uh, who would have been ineligible for Zuma 1, so patients with poor performance status, uh, heart failure, renal failure, things like that. Um, so we have been treating these patients and trying to optimize them as best we can with our cardiology or nephrology colleagues, uh, trying to, you know, I think we have better bridging strategies now with things like polituzumab, um, which actually lead to disease response before CAR-T, which makes patients with poor performance statuses look a little bit better before they get their CARs. Um, so we've been trying to obviously trying to optimize these patients, but still treating them. Because as I mentioned during, um, during that portion of the talk, while they do less well than patients who were great clinical trial candidates, they still do better uh, with CAR than they do uh, in terms of durable response than they do with other available therapies. And I don't want to rob patients who are interested and motivated of that opportunity. Um, and so we, we, we tend to treat those patients, but if they have heart failure, we, uh, you know, we, we make sure that they see our, one of our oncocardiologists beforehand. If they have renal failure, we get renal involved. Um, if they, you know, if they have a high burden of disease and poor performance status, we have better bridging options for them. I hope that answers that question. <laughs> yeah. Another challenging clinical issue that we, uh, that we face is right trying to figure out who's who how, how how much is too much to be able to take somebody to uh to, to cell therapy um well very good well we are approaching time um so i just want to thank you again for for visiting with us this morning and for presenting at grand rounds uh one one of these days we would love to have you down at our campus uh for an in-person visit and we'll have to find the right time to do that but uh, otherwise thanks so much again to everybody for attending uh and hope everyone has a great day okay Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.